Welcome to Unguided. And in this episode, we'll be exploring the waters of New Zealand. More importantly, the Cook Strait and the fishing vessel Francis. Built in 1984 in Western Australia. Made from marine ply and Australian hardwood. This thing weighed 17 tonne and had a single V8 Scania diesel engine. We would work 100 pots normally and would pick them every day, depending on the weather. Some days we could leave them soaked for up to five nights and still have good craze in them. Pots would weigh between 70 and 100 kilos. The pots had to be heavy enough and strong enough to withstand the force that the cook strait would provide every day. If it wasn't the swell, it was the strong current that would be moving the pots. Having to be on time for the tide was imperative to get the pots every day, otherwise you just wouldn't see them for up to six hours. So we had to make sure that we wouldn't overcommit to the strongest part of the tide. We would shoot the pots anywhere between 5 and 50 metres. We would haul the pots up with individual ropes up to 14 mils thick with two floats to As we hauled the pot to the surface, we would have it land on the special rack that we designed specifically. Once it would hit the landing rack, we could then slide it down onto our rail set inside from the outside of the boat, just to make things way easier on our back. Once the craze were measured, they're put into a live tank. Here's the boat that I used to work on when I first started. Beautiful. St because this boat's so deep, it hugs a lot better to the bottom. Some people want to be on a tropical beach. Some people want to be at a nice restaurant. I want to be out here getting cold and wet and catch nothing. The crayfish generally started to bite around the full moon and a dropping swell. Francis had a draft of 1.5 metres, sat really nice and low in the water, and had a... It's the worst stretch of water in the country. Like we're already pushing ourselves to do 100 days a year. Like we're fishing in weather that you know most people would just look out the window and go, nope. You just put a jacket on, wipe the salt away from your eyes. Oh, aye, 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 aye. Uh, when we were cray fishing, we were doing set netting for butterfish and uh, we were doing it out of the dinghy for a little bit there and it proved to be quite successful. We used the Francis as a bit of a mothership so we can get in close. We would shoot our nets and normally shoot about 10 nets at 100 metres long each. As soon as the fish are aboard, they're gutted instantly 
just to keep the condition of the fish just that much better for export quality. Once we finish today's barter fishing, we take that to our exporting factory and then it's sent via our fish broker into the Sydney and Melbourne fish markets and then they go on to the auction floor. Butter fishing was always the hardest work to do. Cray fishing was definitely the funnest and probably the most rewarding, especially seeing the pots coming up so full of fish. The hard part was loading up the boat with all the pots and getting them out into the sea. I had to do that two or three times every year, each to bring them in and to chuck them out. A lot of tough work. When I first purchased the Francis, uh, we gave her a good makeover and sort of rearranged the deck a little bit to sort of make it a bit more simple and easier to work with. And the engine hatch wasn't flush with the deck, but you soon got used to it. With a fresh makeover and also a reconditioned gearbox that we blew, we tackled days like this here in Palliser Bay. It may not look like too much, but we were only 100 metres offshore and the waves were that big. And when we weren't getting battered by the wind, we were out line fishing. Line fishing was pretty challenging in the Cook Strait because of the tide, but also the weather in offshore, it just made it pretty difficult to get a good day. But when you did, and the weather was great, it just felt awesome, especially getting days where it's the beautiful Bay was calm, a beautiful and then you get a big load of fish. But that wasn't always the case, especially with one day. Because on the other side of the coin, you get days like this where it's just howling and we need to go to work on this. It's not very fun at all. Despite all the bad weather and all the obstacles we faced, we were there for one thing and one thing only, and that was to catch lots of fish. These are school shark, and these are ling. We would keep the heads from the ling for our cray pots as bait. They worked a treat. Uh, this is mainly hapuka, or um, groper as it's known elsewhere. Uh, sometimes we get bass, but these are mainly groper in this, this picture here. We'd be catching them anywhere from 100 metres and up to 400 metres. And we'd be catching the ling uh, a little bit deeper, sort of around about 500, 600 metres. Because the fish are coming up from so deep, they would float up to the surface and it was always a great feeling. And here's a big load of butterfish just happily sitting there just with the deck hose over it waiting to be unloaded as we'd run out of bins always a good feeling coming back to port especially before the sun went down was also a great feeling some of the feelings could never be surpassed such as this one here i was out by myself and that was 114 fish that was such a good tide it was only three hours in the water what a good day. More recently I had added an, a net hauler which made light work of hauling up these warrior nets which were set down at about 100 metres, about 150 metres, targeting warrior and Moki. This was such a good asset for the boat proof it's worth. We would shoot one net of 600 metres long and 12 metres high from lead line to float line. We'd shoot it for about five to six hours. We would only shoot the net usually for no first thing in the morning. Four hours as we wanted we'd to maintain freshness to the absolute maximum. About a couple of hours just before lunch. 
and make our way home after hauling it, clearing it as we steam home. This hauler is called a luff hauler. And it's actually a series of pistons that would clamp down as the, as the uh, drum would rotate and would clamp down on the, on the lead line and the float line. We would pull the net into a big pile onto the deck and then we would pull it back into two separate piles separating the lead line and the float line getting it ready to shoot for the next day. But the real fun was in the line fishing. That was definitely a lot of satisfaction getting a good line of fish coming up. These are all separate days and separate fishing trips. I'd normally shoot about anywhere from 5 to 10 separate set lines with a grapple anchor at the bottom and about 100 to 150 hooks per line. Even though we're using thin 8mm rope and good floats, they were still getting pulled under with the tide. It was that ferocious. Line fishing in the Cook Strait was just all about tide, tide, tide. That was my best single day's cray fishing. And this is the dinghy loaded up with butterfish nets. Just can't get any more on. And the rude part was we had another four more nets in the water to come. Long day. Sometimes we'd fish a little bit deeper so we wouldn't need the dinghy to get in close. And we'd do it straight from the launch, catching the butterfish. A little bit tricky getting around the rocks, but you could do it. If one of these sacks was full with a 100 metre net and we couldn't close it up, we knew there'd be 500 kilos worth of fish in one of those sacks. They would average about 300 kilos worth of fish. If you're pulling butterfish nets on in the Wellington South Coast, you haven't got much time to beat the current or the tide turning. Line fishing did prove to be the most fun and the most rewarding for the fact that you could see the fish coming up and big floating line. But if we weren't doing that, we were trying our hands at something else. So we gave lining for snapper a go, and it came off really good. Heaps of big fish, good quality size, and really easy to catch. Everything was going well, catches were up, we were looking good. But then one day, it didn't go good. I actually first started running the Francis on behalf of a company back in 2015. We were doing a bit of lining and quite a lot of gill netting as well. Uh, we used to park it at Queen's Wharf in the centre of Wellington uh, up against uh, Steve Marie. Here's Phil uh, and selling it to me on the first day. Here's Brad with a nice big skate and here's me with a butterfish. And here's us wrestling about a 15 kilo octopus that we caught one day. For the size of this octopus, he's strong. Oh. Hold that up. Oh, if we can get him off. I'll give him a sunlight. Oh! Some things never got old, like seeing all the wildlife that was surrounded by us in the coast drain. We had everything from dolphins to whales. Not only that, we had great geology. With this being here for Corey Light, standing at 23 metres tall. Here's me with a nice bass, and here's the boat out of the water. We did get some glorious days way, way out. This is about 30 miles from shore, and we got it absolutely beautifully calm. 
everyone chipped in and everyone helped. My mum, she did a bit of sign writing. We did get to see some humpbacks put on a good show for us once before. The boat was always looking great no matter what the day was. Heaps of big sharks and it's always a safe place to anchor up, especially in the island bay. We tried new things by targeting different species like wrasse and paddle crabs, just trying out different things. It was all going well, it was, it was all an adventure, some things that have to come to an end. This right here is the last few moments and the few shots that I have of the Francis before it met its fate. So this right here is actually the last two pictures that, the, um, that I have of the Francis before it went. May 15th, 2021. We departed from Wellington at about 11 o'clock at night to make our way over to the east coast. By about 3 in the morning we had reached Cape Palliser and I was at the helm. Unfortunately, I fell asleep at the helm and the autopilot decided to do a 90 degree twice and take us up the beach while I was asleep for 20 minutes. Generators and chainsaws and shit. We've got a bro of a quad. Yeah. And we're in the middle of fucking nowhere. On the worst road I've ever driven. I love driving. This is just this is driving. This is just falling with style. <laughs> <laughs> Crashing with no style. But who cares? It's not my you. Oh, whoa, hey. not, not my insurance bill. Great you, great you. But well, I quite literally pissed on Kieran's you. He knows about it. That's okay. Clean the mud off. Here we go in the distance. Here's our big digger. Here's the remote beach in the buttfuck middle of nowhere. Just see Kieran's boat. There. But we're quite literally a mile away from anything. Wow. Mother Nature, man. The hull is cracked in half. Wave hit that before, and the boat was moving its two pieces. Serious amount of sand in there. Let's see it. I don't want to get too close. It's actually the boats moving under under these waves. Give you a perspective where I'm standing. Those guys' shoes are near my head height. In the waves, come all the way the fuck up here. Go over. There's debris, there's a fucking cray pot way over there somewhere. Here it comes now, look at this. Wow. Oh fuck, wet boots. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Look at that. Yeah, how steep that thing's up. Amount of sand in there. This is insane. She's well buried. Look at the size of that wave. Bang. Fuck, wet boots again. Fuck, run, run, run. 
those waves were pounding on that the boat was probably completely over and probably further out in that sort of ship a lot of force the boat's moving now try zoom in this thing seems to see a digger it's a 32 ton digger we saw on the way here coming here Try and pull it out, it's probably going to go out in a few pieces, but get it up the beach. We hit the beach at about 2.30 in the morning. We didn't know we were on the beach for almost an hour and a half. It wasn't until we could feel sand in between our toes that we knew that we were on the beach. We had no way of telling where the beach was apart from the, the direction of the swell. There was no moonlight, no street lights, nothing. And all four of us had to hang on for four hours as the four and a half to five metre swells broke across the top of the boat. We hung on and we waited it out until we had a definite sign of sunlight. big waves coming in. Oh, we're standing way the fuck up here and we're getting wet. we we'll try and dig a bit of a hole and spin this around and drag it up. At some point gotta get strops on it and try not to snap the thing in half and lose two bits. Can't emphasize these waves enough though man, they are banking up like massive walls. There's only a little one. It's tiny. They're getting like they're going over the top of the boat at that point. Right, let's stop around the prop. Let's see how this goes. Stand back, man. Fuck, this thing goes bang, eh? That strop. Oh, it's moving. I think it's doing a fucking wheelie. Slowly turning. It's just moving the digger. The boat's not moving, the digger's tipping. Alright, that's spinning. Big wave coming, bro. Look at that one there. What a fucking monster. 
in the east today. Trains on the engine back there. Prop. Just try pulling off the back, and the whole back was just disintegrating. But the whole front of it's completely full of sand and water, and it's anchoring it. It's also a big rise here. Stand back. Here we go. Go time. the debris. Yep, there we go. Woo! Yeah, it's like it's breaking the heart. It's breaking, eh?
and there was no more. There he is. Broken rib stitches. Coming back. There's the other half there. Hey, Karen, scrape the other end, bro. Scrape the other end. Oh, this is the last we saw the Francis. all that's left. Front of the boat there, back of the boat there, foot in between. State Highway 1. drag the boat to there you can see the sand's all been turned up there I don't know if you can actually see but there's seaweed and stones and this is all from in between Sunday and now the waves have actually come up to here um, and that's just been this week so we're very 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 lucky that it wasn't even bigger Here's probably a better example of how high the water comes up. So you can see the wet sand. And just there is a piece of the debris from the boat. So just shows how far this water comes. And I'm probably guessing that's a good 500 meters, close to, at least 300 meters. So it's pretty far. Well, this is the exact spot, just on the side of the road. Put this up. Says, rest in peace, doesn't use a Francis, the date. Put in this Australia, 1994, 3.4 meters from overall, 624 horsepower, 240 in Scania.
Built the fish for crayfish, but created a legacy. And yeah, thank you to and Jenna Smells of White Rock Station. You saved us. And many other people did too. We all saved each other. I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that helped out with the whole time that I had the Francis. The cleanup, the fishing, the everything. You've all been fantastic. And you have been too for listening and checking in with my channel. Thanks very much everyone and I really hope that you like and subscribe and share this to your friends. Because I edited it all unguided. Cheers everyone.